All right. Um, you have to learn them by Roman Roman numeral as well as by name. So today in the lecture, it had it listed for the parasympathetic. What did it say? It had three, seven, ten, right? Listed out there. And I went, what's seven again? That's the I said trigeminal slash facial. And Levine was like, it's the facial. All right. So you got to make sure. So if you will recall, I did one station where I just put in there. What is the name of cranial nerve, blah, blah, blah. And I gave you the number. OK, so you have to give me its full name. All right. On these models, you know, on the eyeball, we're going to get the oculomotor, the optic, the abducens and the tr and the uh, trochlear. On the ear, you get um, you get the vestibular cochlear. So that's and then on this one, trigeminal is pretty easy and olfactory is pretty easy. So that's like seven of them. I can put stickies on, on the models. So chances are the other potential five or six that I haven't quite been able to put a sticky on, those would probably be the ones that I would give you their number and expect you to give me their name. Okay, so the six or seven that I can put stickies on at some point here and there, and it's really clear which one I'm talking about. I'll probably do that for them. And then there will be three out of the other five to six that I can't put stickies on that you'll just have. What is this one's name? OK, all right. So. For the 12 cranial nerves, all right, you start anterior and you go towards basically down and then you go well, or you go. You move anterior posterior and then you move kind of downward. OK, so for the olfactory, you were going to see like the big lining of it and then you're going to see it flatten out. If you look in chapter 17, the olfactory is sitting where you're at the base of the skull. And remember, there's that sphenoid bone and there's the ethmoid bone. And in the ethmoid bone, we have the cribriform plate and the cribriform plate has those air cells. You're olfactory bulb is where the nerve kind of flattens out and that flattening out is where there's a synapse. So there are going to be neurons sitting in that olfactory bulb that start there and then head towards eventually the temporal lobe. And then there's neurons that are tied to those the bulb neurons that push in. Through the ethmoid bone through the cribriform plate into the nasal passageway and then tie into the chemical cells that are your receptors. OK, so when we kind of went through sensory afferent pathways, usually there's the the first order neuron is the one tied to the receptor. OK, and so in the olfactory, that's the one that's touching the cell and heads to the olfactory bulb. The second neuron is usually the one we think of as the inner neuron from the spinal cord. It jumps over and heads up or it stays and heads up in the columns. In this case, the second order neuron is the one from the olfactory bulb heading inward. And if it's going to go into that diencephalon area towards that thalamus, part of it will have a little peel off because remember some of this smell is going to get tied into the limbic system. And it's going to help you tie in memory and emotion and things like that. And then the rest of it's going to be eventually heading to some of the neurons. If we open here and go inward to where we have that primary. Olfactory cortex. OK, so that's cranial nerve number one. All right, cranial nerve number two, you can see where this it looks like little two little eyeballs. So those nerves are going to head out. When you look at your eye model, eyeball model, all right, here are all the neurons. Again, they're carrying information away that eventually connect at this little segment here. OK, and you can see right where it is. There's a crossing over point. So the crossing over point is the um, optic chiasm, right? And when you look in chapter 17 and see 
50% of what is in your right eye for rods and cones and sensory information crosses over and heads to the left visual cortex, 50% stays. So that's why your eyes, you see a little bit with both eye for both visual cortex areas, okay? Um, all right, so again, when we are looking at our eyes, you so remember just like with the with the olfactory you have cells in this case the cells are given the name the rods and the cone cells okay and the rods are going to be full of rhodopsin so opsin and retinol so that's why people who have a retinol deficiency vitamin a deficiency sometimes have visual problems specifically at night okay uh your cone cells are going to have a different type of chemical makeup and again the theory that's guiding us is you have a red cone cell a genetically made green cone cell and then a genetically made blue cone cell okay and they respond to within the roy g bib they respond to certain peaks of energy better in the red spectrum the green spectrum or the blue spectrum and then a little bit of overlap when the when you're in yellow or you're in purple is part of how you get the brain to, to figure out the color, okay? So those cells, light energy is hitting them. The first order neuron is that bipolar neuron that's gonna connect to these cells and then it kind of just takes a little space into the retina, all right? And it sits really close. It's not a big cell. It sits really close to the cone cells. That's the first order neuron. Its synapse is still in the eyeball, and it's the second order neuron that's known as your ganglionic neuron. That's the neuron that is going to have its axon exiting and becoming part of that optic nerve. That's the neuron that's gonna have some of its axons at the um, chiasm crossover, and some are gonna end. That's the one that some of its axons are gonna have information that goes into the penile gland and influences melanin or not melanin production because it's telling the penile gland light or no light right okay and then eventually those will get to your occipital synapse and then trigger the occipital cortex okay so that's cranial nerve number two right cranial nerve number three on here usually is going to come out near so this one doesn't really have it should come out up here right and it's usually a little strange so again not a good one to try to find on here but on the outside here you see yellow and then in here you see yellow this yellow in the eyeball not necessarily coming into and out of the retina but going into the area to influence the muscles, to go into the area to influence the iris and constriction and dilation of it to make the pupil change size. Some of the information to change your lens, influence again, do I try to look far away? Those kind of things, move your eyeball. That is your oculomotor. And your oculomotor is a mixed nerve. So some of the sensation of touching. So last time, remember my, my left contact? I can't even wear it anymore. Just, it just bothers my eye. It feels like it's, there's a scratch to it or something. Well, how is my eye feeling that? Because of some of that sensory receptors pulled on the oculomotor. It's nothing visual. It sees fine. It's just irritating. Okay? So that would be your oculomotor, right? Now, just to review, your oculomotor, there are six muscles that we have for the eyeball, okay? So four are running long. So superior rectus, lateral rectus, inferior rectus, 
medial rectus. Okay. Your superior medial inferior okay and your kind of uh lateral inferior oblique here those are all controlled by the oculomotor okay so how do i know on this model which one is superior medial you have to look at the obliques so coming off the sclera here there's a movement towards the inside the way the superior oblique turns, it's telling you what's medial. And then down here, this inferior kind of, it's going to eventually end up being oblique, right? And it's always on the lateral side. Okay. On this model, you get another clue, right? So again, there's that superior oblique kind of tendon part. And then you can kind of see this one here coming off and it's going to go oblique. You get the lacrimal glands, and the lacrimal gland is, you, is, is lateral placement. Okay, so that's how you know this is lateral versus medial. So this is a right eyeball. Okay, so cranial nerve number three is going to help me control superior rectus, medial rectus, inferior rectus, and then that oblique on the lateral that kind of runs downward. Okay, all right. Next cranial nerve is your trochlear. Your trochlear is going to control your superior rectus, uh, superior oblique. Okay, so one station you're going to walk up to the eyeball and it's going to be identify the indicated muscle. So if I put, and it says number five on this model, if I put the sticker on here, you would then want to tell me this is the superior oblique. Another station, I may have the exact same three muscles. I'm going to ask you, name the cranial nerve that controls this muscle. So you would then be expected, if it's this one, to tell me it's the trochlear. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next cranial nerve is going to control the lateral um, rectus muscle. That one. We've all seen someone who has a lazy eye. So the lazy eye is a result of the abducens. So that nerve is pushing the muscle of the lateral rectus muscle to contract stronger than all the others. And so what's happening is the pupil of that eye is pulled to not be in alignment with the other one and it's pulled off to the side. That's why we call it a lazy eye because it tends to kind of like look like the pupil is hanging over and, and drooping, okay? So we would want, again, for that abducens to somewhat be Botoxed or inhibited because we want the muscle to be balanced by the rest of them. What nerve does that? Abducens. A, B, D. The abducens is triggering those muscles to contract. And think about it. Why is the eye being pulled? Because the muscles are contracting more, pulling that eye off of where, looking straight ahead. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Good to see that one. All right, so that the, that's the abducens. So again, you're going to see one station of an eyeball. What is the muscles? There are six muscles, so I'm going to ask you three of them. You're going to come back to a different eyeball, and I'm going to ask you, what are the cranial nerves controlling? Because there are three cranial nerves that I can ask that way. Okay, so the eyeball has up to four, way, four cranial nerves that you are responsible for. Because it has the optic oculomotor, trochlear, abducens. Okay. All right. Then you get to trigeminal and facial. Okay. And then again, for those questions more on lecture, I would probably give you the, you know, what are they controlling? All right. Now on here, the trigeminal is a big white circle towards the outside. 
Okay, so the trigeminal is one of the landmarks on here that is pretty clear. It's a big nerve. And when you look at the pictures, it to me, it makes me think of like a Star Trek thing. It has like three big ganglia that separate and it has some influence over the forehead, the face, and then into the jaw. All right. And when people get, so I went to the dentist on Tuesday. So, you know, I always think like, oh, if they're going to shoot me up with some lidocaine, they're actually going to numb the trigeminal nerve because the trigeminal nerve has some of those inputs into your teeth. Okay. And then the facial, you think the facial would be more of that, but the facial has some other pieces and components um, going to the salivary glands and the lacrimal gland and things like that. OK, so be aware trigeminal and facial are going to do a lot with. Our face, OK, and the trigeminal it because it's such a big nerve, it's like this big white piece coming off of the. Um, here. OK, then we go through the rest of them and I had to use my pictures and cheat last time because, you know, that's how it works. All right, so trigeminal facial. Vestibular cochlear comes off next. And again, I wouldn't probably do it on the brain because it's much easier to put a piece of tape here and ask you what is the nerve here. So the vestibular cochlear is tied to your inner ear. OK, the cochlear part is going to go to the little snail looking part. That's your cochlear area where you have your cochlear duct, your tympanic membranes, you have the endolymph, the perilymph, the scala tympani, the scalar vestibuli, and you have the sound waves being converted to waves in the water, waves in that material that are going to trigger the hair cells. And those triggered hair cells are then brought by these nerves, neurons, to your auditory cortex. Okay. All right. The vestibular part, the middle here, which is where those endolymph and the round and the oval windows start and finish. So again, the sound part is going towards the cochlea, but the other part of the middle is where you have what's known as your otolith organ. And that otolith organ is like rocks, calcium carbonate rocks sitting on like a sea salt platter. OK, and in 1G gravity, those rocks move based on static. What's your head position? So when I chin down, gravity pulls the rocks down. So the seesaw looks like this and it lets me trigger the nerve to say the head's pointing down. If I do chin up, seesaw goes like that. Rocks fall back and it triggers that nerve to tell me head up. OK, so when you have people kind of modding their head a lot and it's getting, you know, they're getting a little dizzy or getting a little, you know, you tell people to hold their head still, you're trying to get the otoliths to stop maybe over producing signals. OK, the semicircular canals and again, the vestibule in the middle, there is a big kind of like ampulla, a big kind of domino piece. OK, and there's fluid running in the three, so X, Y, Z. So this is physics, okay? And those canals, there's fluid, and remember fluid is gonna move when you accelerate. So if I accelerate forward, the fluid starts to circle forward. And there's always a little delay, okay? And Fluid, once you get it going and you stop, kind of keeps going. So that's sometimes why we like keep going even when we stop. OK, if I start going in that lateral direction side to side again, the fluid will get going that way. And then if I go up in the elevator or down in the elevator, that's. The Z direction. OK, now again with my Air Force background. If you have to go at least two degrees per second, there's like a, a threshold. So if you go too slow and move forward or back. You ever had that feeling like in your car, like you're rolling, but you didn't sense you were rolling, all right? So again, the sensation will start if you accelerate beyond a certain threshold. 
And that becomes a problem with airplanes is if you think you're an automatic pilot, it sometimes kicks off and you just have a slow tilt sub threshold. And then all of a sudden the slow tilt's going to point the nose at the ground and you're going to start to have things bleep, 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 and then people freak out like we still think we're straight and level, but we're actually nose diving to the ground. So that's how some of those plane things happen when you can't see. You're in the weather, you're at night and you go sub threshold. The other thing is when you are going and you stay at a certain rate. So we all get this in an airplane. I stop feeling like I'm moving. So when you have the fluid moving and the vehicle is moving at the same rate and it stays that constant for a long period of time, you'll stop feeling like you're moving. And so then when the change occurs, you feel like all of a sudden like, oh, now we're moving and, and you didn't realize it before. OK, so there's some some other kind of illusions that way as well. OK, um, these semicircular canals, this fluid is tied to your stomach because this fluid is tied to if I ingested poisons and poisons potentially make the fluid more runny like alcohol. All right. If it's more runny and I'm out of balance and I'm unsafe, then I need to throw it up. Okay, so um, part of the reason why many people throw up when they drink a lot of alcohol comes from it. Alcohol makes the fluid more runny. You then become with small movements that thresholds is less and you start to feel that and you get dizzy and you throw up. Okay. A mismatch of what your ears are getting from the vestibular system, from the semicircular canals, a little bit of the otolith organ versus what your eyes are getting and what proprioceptors are getting from your joints, from your muscles. That is how you get motion sickness. And again, if the eyes can see the horizon, even if your ears are going out of whack, so being on a boat on a lovely day, it's fine being on a boat in weather, in cloud, in fog at night where you can't see and you go up and down, forward and side to side, more people will get sick. OK, so the visual cues can override a lot of the vestibular system for motion sickness. OK, 70 percent of astronauts when they get into space are sick for the first 24 hours, and it's because the otolith is no longer working correctly because there's no gravity. Proprioceptors are no longer working correctly because there's very little gravity and, 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 and feedback. Visual system does not have a good horizon line. And when you move, there's not like a, a stopping force inertia so you can kind of get yourself spinning and then it all just is hectic on your poor stomach. And to create gravity would mean to get like a centrifuge to get a spin. And so it's like, can I create a spin and get gravity? But then what would it do to my ears? So that's part of the reason why we haven't solved the whole, can we go to Mars? And as we go there, can we have a gravitational artificial gravity generated in the spaceship? Can't figure that out yet. OK, so enough of that. All right, so there's vestibular. All right, the next big ones for the most part are coming off. So ah, you'll see them coming off near the um, medulla, right? And so there's, I, I don't remember them all per se, but there's the big one, there's some of the big ones here and then the two here, but those are gonna be your vagus, your hypoglossal, Glossal pharyngeal and um, and again, a lot of the reason why they're coming off in that brainstem area is, you know, they're going towards the back of your throat. They're going to control your tongue. They're going towards. I guess it's actually going downward and it's going to connect into your heart, connect into your areas in your chest. All right. And remember from today we learned. Cranial nerves carry parasympathetic influence. Anything I want to do sympathetic wise is going to have to come out of like T1, T2, and then go to the ganglia, synapse, and then that postganglionic neuron is going to actually come back up and in T1, 
to get to my eyeball, to get to my salivary glands and things like that. Okay. All right, so cranial nerves. Okay, going to the eye again, we've done the muscles, we've done the cranial nerves. For the external features of the eye, I don't really have models. So for at least the in-person exam, you wouldn't pretend, I, I, I wouldn't have that unless I put the picture from the book. I won't have anything other than this is the lacrimal gland. The whole apparatus is the gland, tears, and then you start to have your ducts. And remember those ducts connect so tears can end up in your in your nose. And so we've all been there where we probably cried so much that we're leaking fluid out of our nose. OK, uh, and canaliculi, you remember little tunnels in the bone? So you start to see canaliculi for some of the small tunnels that are created for the, the duct work that connects eyes to um, nose. Everything tends to move lateral. And again, the natural curvature is to bring it medial and then bring it down. So that's why your ducts are down in that area there. All right. Um, for your conject conjectiva, so you hear about people have conjectivitis. That's actually the skin underneath your eyelids. So when you know that weird guy in the playground back in the day would flip his eyelids, he's showing you his conjectiva. Okay. Um, okay. So eyeball layering. The outermost layer, which is what we consider the white, that has to have some dense irregular connective tissue because, again, it's going to eventually connect into these tendons. And these tendons, remember, come from the endomyosin, the perimyosin, the epimyosin that's around the muscles, all right? Those have to bind to something. And in this case, it's not bone, it's the sclera. So the sclera is the white part. The part of the outer part of the eye that is clear, and so neither one of these really have it, but it would be a clear part here. It's not going to have a lot of blood vessels, and it's going to be full of some epithelial cells that go through a lot of division. That is going to be your cornea, right? And your cornea does a big part of as light energy comes through, your cornea does start to bend the light. And the point of bending the light is we want the light rays to converge to a certain point. OK. All right. Second layer is going to be your vascular layer. So sometimes it's known as the cord layer. OK, that's where a lot of the blood vessels are coming in and then they will push out and push inward. And those blood vessels that push out are going to be the capillaries that feed your sclera and then eventually can even push in and maybe feed some of the muscles here. Your nerve for the ocular motor is going to push into that layer, right? And so it's it's a big connective tissue layer between the outermost and the innermost. OK, the innermost layer is going to be your retina, right? Now, the muscle, that's the iris, the ligaments and the ciliary components that help make the lens all of that is part of your middle layer okay from the lens to the cornea you're going to end up creating a little chamber that's the anterior chamber and that is full of aqueous humor that is the humor the water that if we're overproducing it is pushing on the lens and pushing on the cornea and creating potentially glaucoma that would then eventually damage both of those features and cause blindness. OK, so the old glaucoma test was they did a little poof of air and they wanted to see that the water pressure in that anterior chamber wasn't so high that when the air pushed on the cornea, it would deform in. If it didn't deform in, then there was too much fluid and too much pushing out on the cornea, too much pressure. OK, from the lens to the back to the retina, is going to be your posterior chamber. That is full of virtuous humor, right? And that's a little bit more jelly-like because that's going to help suspend some of these cones and rods and bipolar cells and ganglionic cells. We don't want them to be loosey-goosey, you know? We want them to be kind of sitting a little bit better, okay? Again, on this model, it shows you that the retina, 
okay, that the retina has these kind of simple cuboidal looking cells, all right? They are going to then kind of make little, little spots that let the rods and the cones sit and hold steady in, okay? These cells are gonna be very rich in melanin. So remember your melanin that makes your skin color, they are gonna make these cells pretty dark pigmented. And the goal would be that any light energy that gets through all the cracks and doesn't hit a rod or a cone cell, we would absorb that light energy. And you're gonna find in cows and in cats and in a lot of animals that live at night, they are gonna have certain of these cells that have the translucence that reflects that light energy. And that's part of how those animals see better at night because the energy of light that's missed initially is reflected back upward and can catch the rods and cones as it goes the opposite direction. Okay, but that doesn't work in us, All right? So that's why you see, again, lots of melanin. So an albino person, their lights tend to, their eyes can tend to really, really, really have a translucentness to it because they don't have that melanin being produced at all in that retinal layer, right? And again, for this retinal layer, all right, these little yellow cells, they are, again, epithelial type cells. They are trying to stay anchored to the cord layer. And then there's the sclera. They're trying to stay anchored by, you know, gap junctions and just proteins. And so when you hear about someone having a retinal displacement, it's, it's kind of like the epithelial layer disconnects from the underlying connective tissue and it, it collapses inward, okay? And so that's what happens when people have retinal displacements, okay? Now, on your retina, remember you had energy being bent initially by the cornea, then the lens is trying to help you bend maybe the light energy really up close. So the convergence on the retina is of maybe what's in three feet in front of me. Okay, now if I manipulate the lens and I want the light energy from something 20, 30 feet far away to be what I'm focusing on, the lens is then helping me kind of dissect out, do I want the light energy from far away to be what converges on my retina or do I want the light energy from things up close? Do I want to focus on Levine or do I want to focus on the kidneys back there? So the lens is helping me, again, get the convergence of the light energy from far away or the light energy from up close, right? And that convergence on the retina is gonna hit this one spot mainly. That one spot is a depression. And so it's called the macula because it's a depression. In the center of it is known as the fovea centralis. This area is very, very, very rich in cone cells. So during daytime where we see in color, this is our best visual acuity. So when you're doing your visual acuity test and they're trying to see, do you see 20, 20, 2015, 20, 25, 20, 30, they're actually testing your ability of the system to put the light on here. And then we're testing to make sure these cone cells see and discern all the information. Okay. Now we know we have cone cells in the outer margins of the retina because otherwise I would see a small window in my field of color and then everything else would be black and white, but that's not how it works. But the best visual acuity, the best like visual perception of my three by three degree window of where I see the best comes from that fovea centralis. Okay. Now the optic disc is going to be this area in the retina where there's no rods and cone cells. It's also sometimes known as your anatomical blind spot. Now it's off center and you have one on the right and one on the left, but because the eyeballs overlap in what is seen in the right and what is seen in the left and they share, you don't notice you have a blind spot unless you specifically test for it. And the way they test for it is you cover one eye and then you look at a circle and then there's a little kind of picture that's going to be off to the side. And then what we do is we bring that image forward and at some point the picture is going to be hitting at the angle that the light rays are on your optic disc and the picture disappears. 
So you can only see it if you have one eye. And you can only see it again as you specifically test for it. OK, so that is your anatomical blind spot. The fovea centralis, because it's mostly cone cells at night, is considered your physiological blind spot. Your rods, which are your better visual receptors for low light levels, are in your periphery more so than in the fovea. Okay, so at night, one, you don't see well because cones don't see well. And if you try to focus on something in low light levels, it tends to flicker because that's your eye naturally trying to constantly move to keep the energy of whatever you're trying to focus. And it's going to make something look like it's floating or flickering. Okay, so again, when you learn to drive at night, they tell you to constantly scan with your eyes and not to focus in on anything in particular because the fovea is a physiological blind spot. Okay, and then rhodopsin, to be able to trigger it, you have the, you have three stages, somewhat like our sodium channels in the neuron have like ready to be turned on, open, and then they're transitioning once they're closed. Rhodopsin has, it's ready to be triggered, it's triggered, and then it has its transition, right? So again, at night, if you go into, from the movie theater to outside, sometimes you wash out all of your rods at once, or somebody has a flashlight and they blind you and they wash out all your rods, it takes time all of those rhodopsin go wash and it takes time for all of them to transition and kind of like our uh, muscles do they set up in groups and this guy gets stimulated then this guy gets stimulated then this and they take turns and that's how eventually in a movie theater it feels like you see better after about 20 to 30 minutes because you get that you kind of get your night vision going with your rods and your little groups okay so it takes just one big flash all of them will wash out and then it feels like I'm blind for a little while. And so that's another way you can be physiologically blind at night is to wash out all those rods at once. Did I get everything for the most part? OK. All right, moving to the ear. So your ear is going to have three components. OK. This part we've already hit on is your inner ear, right? And the inner ear is the snail is the cochlea, and that's all about auditory, okay? The vestibule is the middle, and it's going to be where the otolith organ is. It's going to be the connection to the semicircular canals, and it's going to be where your rounds and your oval windows are located. And then you have the semicircular canals, okay? Now, the round in the oval window, if I unroll this, the round window is the one that the stapes, our ossicle, is pounding on. And as it's pounding on it, the fluid behind it begins to make the waves in the same frequency, same amount uh, that it's being hit. And those waves are going to travel through that endolymph, through that pathway, until they hit the area where they can cross into that cochlear duct, hit the, again, o organ of corti, and trigger the hair cells to be stimulated for that frequency, that sound. Okay. They'll then continue to dissipate through back to the oval window. What's that? I think you said round window when you meant to say oval. Window. Okay, I flipped it. So the oval window is where the stapes is hitting. The round is where it dissipates out. OK, so. With age, with time, again, all of these windows are made up of like connective tissue and they have some elasticity and some movement. With age, with time, that is going to tighten up and be less elastic. So part of some of the hearing loss we associate with age is just physiologically the changes of the oval and the round windows are less pliant, less movable. OK, all right. In the middle ear, the middle ear is what we consider the air behind the tympanic membrane. 
where our ossicles are located. And then there's usually a connection into the back of your nose, the back of your throat, where your adenoids sit. And that's who you're sta you stationed to, or also it's an auditory canal, but it's you stationed to, okay? That area is full of air. Now, again, all of that area is still very wet because you are a wet body, right? The ossicles are your malleus, your incus, and your stapes. The stapes, again, is usually connected here, and it looks like a little stirrup, okay? The... Uh, one of them looks like a hammer, and then the Incas, I forget what its supposedly nickname is. But Malleus, Incas, and Stapes, okay? Now, they are physically touching the tympanic membrane, and they are physically, with a little bit of cartilage, connected to each other. And remember, how do bones attach to bones? With ligaments, okay? Now, when you get older, these little bones can become more brittle and the ligaments become less elastic. So as we get older, we also lose some ability to take the energy hitting the tympanic membrane and move it to the oval window because the bones are more brittle and the connective tissue, the ligaments, are not letting them be as loosey-goosey and as movable. Okay, so that's some of the more conductive hearing loss that happens. All right, the tympanic membrane is this where your middle ear starts and your outer ear, keep dropping things. So the tympanic membrane is where technically your outer ear ends and your middle ear starts, All right? This is the external auditory canal and this is where people stick Q-tips and their hearing protection, their little ear protectors inside. All right, and then you get to the outside, and the outside can be one of two things. You can call it the pina, and think of it as a funnel gathering sound, gathering waves of sound towards your ears, or it's flappy kind of material, and flappy material that has folds to it we call oracles. Okay, so you can call it either one. All right, and the whole purpose of the outer ear is to bring those sound waves to the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane is considered the first of your mechanical material that starts to vibrate and it then becomes the ossicles to the oval window to the fluid. And so all of those are just moving the sound to the fluid so the fluid can then trigger the hair cells at the appropriate organ of corti to then create an electrical signal in the cochlea, okay? And all of those pieces with time get old, get less elastic, less compliant, less movable. And it's part of why with time, with age, the amount you hear shortens in frequency, shortens in ability. Okay, that's the conductive hearing loss. Anything at the hair cell connection to the cochlea would be more of a physiological reason you don't have auditory. That's not conduction, that's more the hair cells die and you lose that ability to hear them. Doesn't matter how loud it is, you can't, you conduct it there and there's nothing there to sense it. All right, the last piece of the, I don't have a model, but in your cochlea, there's a picture of the model and it shows you the three chambers. The online lab exam will have that picture and will have one station on there. Those of you that take the in-person, unless I put that picture on the lab exam, there's no model for it. So it depends on how motivated I am to put a station with the picture or just stick with the models. All right, online lab exam has that picture. So I expect you to know the scalia tympani, the scalier vestibuli, the cochlear duct. So those are the three chambers. Perilymph is in the Outside, endolymph is in the inside one. So I said that wrong earlier when I was talking about endolymph. It's perilymph that starts moving with the oval window to the round window. And it's endolymph that when you cross that tympanic membrane, you get the endolymph to move and you get the organ of corti to start moving and triggering those hair cells. Okay. All right. So that is your cochlear ducts that is what the cochlea inside looks like 
Okay, and you need to know those key landmarks and key membranes and the part that's the functional is the organ of corti in the cochlear middle chamber where eventually the waves go from the outside chambers and cross over. And it's at the right frequency. Somehow it all knows when it's going to cross over at the right place and trigger those hair cells. OK, and the cochlea is only so many little chambers. So that's why we have a fixed different distance of high frequency to low frequency. We have a certain range that we can hear. And then for that range, there's an optimal range, which is where speech takes place. OK, and that's kind of again, I can lose some of my high and low frequency ability to hear, but I can still hear speech. But then there's a place where if I continue to have hearing loss and damage, I'll potentially even lose some of my ability to hear in the auditory range that's optimal in that uh, speech range. OK, and it and the other thing to look at when you look at the slides and look at the chapter is to start damaging the hair cells, it doesn't take much if there's a really high decibel amount of sound. So being around rocket engines and things on the flight line without hearing protection, you will start to cause damage. With hearing protection, the damage might not be as immediate, but if you spend enough time and exposure, it can still happen. Things that are dangerous to you as a normal person, Small engines, so lawnmowers, tractor equipment, shotguns, people that shoot guns like my parents maybe did without the hearing protection, going hunting without hearing protection. It's pretty standard now. People wear hearing protection. People wear hearing protection when they mow the grass or when they work yard work. Um, blow dryers. If you were to work in a salon and constantly with the blow dryer, that high sound long period of time, you would potentially start to see the hearing loss. So those are some items, again, small little engines, small little devices that make a high decibel sound. If we are unprotected for a short period of time, not a big deal, but as that period of time gets longer and longer and longer and it becomes more part of our day, it is. Uh, concerts, I'm, I'm, I bring hearing protection to concert one because it helps me filter out some of the background noise so I can actually hear the music better. But two, because I like to sit up close so I can actually see. It's like, why go to a concert if I'm watching a TV screen to see my people? I want to pay to see. I want to catch Chester's water from Lincoln Park, which I did. So Chester threw me a water. We had eye contact. OK, that's how I want my concert experience to be. So when I'm that close, the speaker systems are so loud that again for four or five hours once that's fine but if i was doing that all the time you would definitely want to have hearing protection so i always feel bad for like the person who's the deaf signer i mean they have to wear hearing protection because they're standing almost the whole concert with all of those speakers blaring right there near their ears mm -hmm. okay so that's basically what i wanted to go over all right so expect an eyeball of the muscles an eyeball on the cranial nerves inspect an eyeball for some of the outer features expect a station with some internal landmarks and features expect an ear with the outer middle you know at least two ear stations and then definitely on my online people so diane make sure diana you do the cochlear station OK, make sure because that'll show up on your lab exam uh, for okay. again. The rest of the cranial nerves expect one station of just names and being knowing the number and giving me the name and then on your brain station. There might be one. The trigeminal would be a good one and then maybe one other that I might ask you about. Olfactory is another good one. The optic chiasm is another good one or if I get really, really, really crafty, maybe one of these coming off on the medulla. OK, and that's basically the last part of this chapter. Questions? Yes, I have, yes, a, question. I have a question. Yes, Diana. Um, um, so for, so for the, I believe, lab next week, I heard you mention that lecture today um, that it's going to be dissection. Is that pretty crucial for me to attend? No, 
No, so dissection is not on the lab exam. So the purpose of dissection is we have always gone through pieces and parts of the brain when everything is a plastic model, sometimes it's color coordinated and everything looks like it's exactly supposed to. So when we do the sheet brains, everything you should be able to find easily on the plastic model. So that's listed in the dissection, the bold terms. All right, you're gonna try to find them on the sheet brain. Uh, it's not going to be visible where the central sulcus is. It's not gonna be where you expect it. The gyri are gonna be, again, just kind of, everything just is smooshing together. And so okay. the purpose is to actually show you what we're doing on these models where it looks really easy. It really doesn't look easy. And you'll see that next semester when you do the brain, uh, the heart, you think with the heart models like, oh, it's so easy to see everything. Oh, God, no, you can't tell. And especially when you don't have color because everything's been put in formalin and everything's just one shade and all you see is fat and then you see material. It, it's all, a, it's like, uh, I think this is what this is. This is about where it should be. And it just reminds you that when you do things on cadavers, when you do things on live specimen, if they're not fresh where things are still beating like hearts coming out of the rats or the rabbits or the pigs or the cats, it, it is all kind of I'm going to look for things that are supposed to be co-associated with that landmark. And that is how I'm going to guess that that is the landmark. OK, so it just kind of gives that realism and appreciation that if you're going to go to med school, go to dental school, go to PA, OT or DPT, if you're going to go in eventually or a chiropractor even and you start to do the real live specimen or cadavers, you're going to take all of these cues and and things you learn to help you figure out where you are and you're going to apply them and you really do sometimes you guess my husband would say you get to like the diencephalon and then they'll take they'll dissect and it's just like supposedly the thalamus and the hypothalamus and again they're going to also ask you more little minute details and he's like you have three pens sitting in one location and they're asking you three different things and to me he's like i have no idea what i'm looking at and the three pins to me are one location but they're asking me three different places and you just guess and that's where the whole thing of 70 percent really is like 70 percent is my goal because i have no idea what some of those things are so that's the point so diana you would want to use next week's lab to review Okay. Oh, sounds good. Thank you. Okay. I will put dissection on AMP2. I put one station of the rat. I take a picture of him. I opened up and I point to some of the organs. So three to four questions in AMP2 lab exam number three is on the lab exam. And the other thing is some people dissections weird them out. <laughs> they're, they're uncomfortable with this is a sheep brain or a cow eyeball. So again, I give y'all some leeway. Thank you. But if you really want to come do it, that's the lab to come. If you really want to do some hands dirty dissection and try to see, try to really test yourself on how much have I learned of this brain model. OK. OK. So if there's one Wednesday, you want to try to get your family to be like, yeah, I got to take off and I got to get to school. That would be the one to come to. OK, any other questions? OK, so that is all I have. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, Caitlin, when is your next session with you?